Hello friends, my name is Dr. Ashish Goyal and uh, in today's session we are going to talk about a quick approach to diagnosing arthritis. So I'm sure you have already been exposed uh, to an approach to arthritis. However, I'm going to add uh, a little bit more to this and probably we will recapitulate or uh, revise the concept of an approach to arthritis. So an approach to arthritis is practically a, a very mathematical approach. We ask about the demography, we ask about the localization of disease, we ask about the onset, we ask about the progression, the extent, nature, pattern, distribution. In addition to that, we ask about the extraarticular features if there is any family history and we ask about the drugs that the person or the patient has been exposed to. In demography, we would like to know what is the age and sex of the individual. In localization, we determine whether the disease is articular or periarticular or extraarticular because any of these features, any of these kind of diseases could present with joint pains. So we need to establish, is it actually articular involving the joints? When we talk about the onset, we want to know whether it's acute, which is less than six weeks, or chronic, which is more than six months. While we are determining the progression or the nature or the character, we would like to know whether it's migratory or fleeting arthritis. So when we say migratory or fleeting, we mean that one joint is involved, then it recovers, and then another joint is involved, which recovers or shows sign of recovery, and a third joint is involved. That's a pattern of a fleeting arthritis or a migratory arthritis. An intermittent arthritis, you have pain, then it stops, then you have pain again, and then it stops for some time, and then you have pain again. There are inflammations, there are uh, uh, increase and decrease in the course of disease. And then you have an additive uh, kind of a progression in which one joint is involved, it doesn't get settled down. You get another joint which is involved, which doesn't get settled down. And you have another joint which gets involved. When we talk about the extent, we always want to know whether it's a monoarticular, mono means one joint is involved, oligo or posse articular in which we have two to four joints involved, or polyarticular or polyarthritis in which we have more than four joints involved. So this particular question often forms the first question that we ask the patient, how many joints are involved? And this to a great extent determines our differential diagnosis. When we talk about the nature, we want to know whether the arthritis is erosive. That means it destroys the joint structure or is it non-erosive? That means it's not destructive to the joint structure. In distribution, we want to know the central uh, joints are involved or not. The central joints are the axial joints. That means the, uh, the spine, the size of the joints involved, is it the large joints like the knee or the hip or the shoulder or the elbow joint? Or is it the smaller joints which are involved like the metacarpal joints or the tors uh, tarsal and uh, phalangeal joints which are involved? We try to understand the symmetry. Is it symmetrical around the axis? We try to understand whether it's upper limb involvement or a lower limb involvement. So that goes about distribution. Then we try and figure out uh, whether there are any extra articular features such as presence of nodes, involvement of other areas, involvement of uh, skin in terms of ulcers or mucosa in terms of ulcers. Does the person have photosensitivity and other extra articular features? In the nature, we also try to find out very importantly whether the person has an inflammatory arthritis or a non-inflammatory arthritis. In a subsequent slide, we will see how to determine and differentiate between an inflammation versus a non-inflammatory arthritis. We try to figure out the family history and also the drug exposure of the patient. Let's quickly take up each of these uh, in the next few slides. So in demography, obviously we try to find out the age, sex and racial difference in the presentation. In localization, we try and see the range of motion of the joint. 
So if the joint is involved, obviously we will have um, a, a greater range of, mo uh, we'll have pain in the entire range of motion of the uh, joint. We look at the joint stability and we, while testing for the joint movement, we try and see if there is crepitus in the joint. To determine the onset, we see if it's acute or chronic. It's less than six weeks, we say it's acute. And if it's more than about six months, we try and say it's chronic. Everything depends upon the number of joints, whether it's inflammatory or non-inflammatory. And like I said before, the progression, we determine it's fleeting, migratory arthritis, in which case we stop thinking of a rheumatic fever, a gonococcal disease, or a Lyme's disease. Is it intermittent in its character, in its progression? We stop thinking of a gout. Or is it additive in terms of its features in which one joint is added on to the disease while the other is still inflamed? And then we start thinking of a rheumatoid arthritis pattern or an osteoarthritis or a psoriatic arthritis. Like I said, monoarthritis, please remember one joint, oligo or posse arthritis, two to four joints, or a polyarthritis, grid and five or four joints. When we talk of a arthritis, we think of uh, seronegative spondyloarthropathies, we think of gout, we think of psoriasis. When we are talking about monoarthritis, we try and determine whether it's inflammatory or non-inflammatory. We'll see how in a little bit. And again, if it's a poly, uh, if it's an oligo or a posse arthritis, we also think of a juvenile chronic arthritis or a Lyme's disease. Often we get confused on how to differentiate between an inflammatory versus a non-inflammatory arthritis. So an inflammatory arthritis usually would have a morning stiffness greater than one hour, would be ex uh, associated with fatigue, would get better with activity, would worsen with rest, will have a soft tissue swelling, bony swellings would be uncommon. There would be diurnal variations in the pain, the constitutional features such as fever, weight loss, and fatigue would be associated. There would be the classical signs of Ruber, Kaller, Dohler, and tumor. You would find an erased ESR or a CRP. None of these features would be seen in the non-inflammatory picture. So it will be easy for you to understand on a historical uh, background whether it's inflammatory or non-inflammatory. We determine whether we have an erosive pattern, which is destruction of the joints, or it's a non-erosive arthritis. When we think of an erosive pattern, we try and figure out a, rheumat a rheumatoid arthritis, a psoriasis, gout, or a systemic sclerosis. As I said, we look at the distribution, whether the central skeleton or the axial skeleton is involved. We look at the symmetry. Is it asymmetric or symmetric? We look at the size of the joints, upper or lower limb involvement is there. Asymmetric presentations are usually seen in a rheumatic fever or a psoriasis. Rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, so uh, reactive arthritis. Uh, so reactive arthritis is an asymmetric uh, arthritis. It appears incorrectly here on the slide. And psoriasis can present in a symmetric or an asymmetric manner. So the upper limb and lower limb involvement is important to differentiate between features such as uh, spondyloarthropathies and gout which are largely in lower limbs. If it's upper limbs, we'd stop thinking of a hemochromatosis. Upper and lower limb presentations is rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, and psoriasis. They do not have a predilection or a uh, preference to any of the uh, limbs. So who develops an extra articular disease? Usually it's seen that it's uh, individuals who are smoking, have early disability, or a rheumatoid factor positive, when we are talking specifically of a rheumatoid arthritis, they are the individuals who are more likely to develop an extra articular disease. So what's the commonest extra articular manifestation in terms of a rheumatoid arthritis? We would have subcutaneous nodules, we would have pulmonary nodules, anemia, or a Sjogren syndrome. By looking at family history, we have to look for psoriasis, spondyloarthropathies, or osteoarthritis, which run in families. When you're looking for exposure to drugs, we try and figure out if the person has been exposed to statins, zodiacine, chloroquinolones, or chloroquine in their history. 
And this is the last slide I want to talk to you about in a flow or algorithmic approach to oligoarthritis or monoarthritis. So the first question that we want to ask that, is it really arthritis? And then once we've settled that fact, we want to know how many joints are involved. If it's one joint, we call it a monoarthritis. If it's two to four joints, we call it an oligoarthritis. The next question that we want to ask in a monoarthritis is, is this inflammatory and is this acute? If we get an answer which is no, we are largely dealing with an osteoarthritic picture. However, if we find that yes, the in arthritis is inflammatory in nature, we are probably, we are obviously dealing with an acute inflammatory monoarthritis. And the next question that we want to answer is which joint is involved? Was there a recent infection? And are there any extra articular features? Now, if it's a lower limb involvement and there is a sexually transmitted disease in the near past and the person can't see or can't pass urine very easily, then we stop thinking of a reactive arthritis. If it's one joint involved and there is a background of tuberculosis, we might be dealing with a tubercular arthritis. If there is one joint involved and there is evidence of infection, again, we might stop thinking of a septic arthritis or we should start thinking of a septic arthritis as soon as we have one joint presentation in the disease. If we have a great toe which is presenting as an acute inflammatory monoarthritis, we start thinking of a gout, although it doesn't prove gout, then yes, we start thinking of gout immediately. If there are two to four joints involved, again, we ask the first question, is it acute or is it inflammatory? If the answer is yes, obviously we are dealing with an acute inflammatory oligoarthritis. The next question, as previously we ask, is a symmetric distribution. Is it symmetric? What is the distribution? What is the involvement of upper limbs or lower limbs? And are there any extra articular features? Again, if we find that uric acid is raised and crystals and the aspirate from the joint, we confirm it is gout. If the nail and skin changes, which are specific to psoriasis are seen, we stop thinking of a psoriatic arthritis. And if we find that there is the involvement of the axial skeleton with lower backache, mostly the joints involved are below the waist, there is the sacroiliac joint involvement, and HLA-B27 is positive, we start thinking of seronegative spondyloarthropathies, a group which includes ankylosing spondylitis, reactive arthritis, psoriasis, and uh, inflammatory bowel disease. With this, we come to an end of today's presentation, and I hope uh, this was helpful to you. Thank you.